Hey, this is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses, and you're watching GNR Central. Yeah! <laughs> Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to Guns N' Roses Central. Sorry my channel's been a bit erratic the last week. Uh, just haven't had time to upload stuff and I was out of town for a bit. But uh, we've got quite a bit of news to catch up on. So the, one of the bigger news stories that came out last week that kind of slipped under the cracks was that Slash is apparently making at least some journalists sign a pretty surprising contract before conducting interviews. So according to Classic Rock Magazine, uh, they're one of the guys who did one of the first major interviews with Slash. The writer revealed how he had to basically sign, uh, it was almost like a liability waiver, making Classic Rock Magazine responsible for any blowback that would result from his interviews. So Slash, as you guys know, has been promoting his upcoming record, Living the Dream. So in the interview that the Classic Rock Magazine did with Slash, uh, the writer said that there are people who are worried about our conversation. Before I can speak to Slash, I have to sign a contract that says if anything goes wrong, if some kind of stuff hits the fan because of what I write and GNR lose money, then Classic Rock carries the can. This is no small thing when you're dealing with the fourth biggest earning tour of all time. There is paranoia around, and the Not In This Lifetime tour took a lifetime to put together, and no one wants to see that one mess up. No one wants to see it mess up. You might have not noticed, but Guns N' Roses really haven't talked to anyone since they've reformed. They haven't done an interview. So, you know, Slash said that, uh, in I think it was in a separate interview, that before the Not In This Lifetime tour started, he claims that nobody in the band really talked about doing press, and they didn't really give it much thought, because just the announcement of them getting back together would have sold tickets. We've also got some other Slash news. So it was revealed uh, late last month that Slash was going to be designing and contributing music for a maze at Universal Studios upcoming Halloween Horror Nights. So if you follow at Horror Nights on uh, Twitter, they posted a, uh, a trailer for this upcoming uh, maze. So um, it's actually going to be starting in middle of September and then it'll be going pretty much through the end of October. And as you guys know, Slash is a huge horror fan. And not only that, but Slash actually joined a panel uh, in L.A. It was called the L.A. Scare Panel, where he discussed his love of horror, Halloween Horror Nights. So I've linked to that video down below. It's at the 45 minute and 53 second mark where Slash shows up and talks about uh, designing the maze and just like how he loves horror movies. And he, I think he did talk a little bit about his production company as well, which is currently in talks to, to produce four films. And from the same classic rock interview that Slash did, it's not very often that we hear Slash talk about world politics or stuff that's in the news lately, but he would br briefly discuss the Me Too movement, and he made a lot of sense of what he said. I think he said something that a lot of people want to say, but I think they're too afraid of being um, called out in the media or being uh, harassed for expressing their views. So according to Tone Deaf, who transcribed the interview, they said, ever since the Me Too movement went viral in October, countless women around the world have found support and encouragement in the name and shame of some of those who have abused them in the past. While this movement has led to a number of high-profile individuals being accused of misconduct, others have spoken out against the movement, criticizing its success and methods. So while Marilyn Manson explained in December that the Me Too movement will ruin a lot of people's lives, Garbage is Shirley Manson criticized actor Liam Neeson for summing it up as a bit of a witch hunt. And notorious uh, comedic glam metal pop group Steel Panther stated that the movement was making it hard for them to perform. So Slash discussed with Classic Rock a lot of the false accusations within the movement. So he was asked by the interviewer uh, whether the movement had affected the music business, to which he said, it's a good question, Slash explained. I think the Me Too movement is definitely justified. It's actually way overdue. However, he noted that it was complicated in the context of being in a rock and roll band. Fortunately, I'm taken, so I'm not dealing with all that. But I have to admit, there were times I looked into my past as if he's talking to himself. Well, that was consensual. I never had a relationship with anybody that I was, you know, trying to pressure into having sex or anything, he continued. The problem is that you could easily be falsely accused of something, but it doesn't matter. It's out there. Even if you were to get your name cleared, the damage is already done, and that's pretty sad. In other Slash news, and maybe you guys are going to see a theme here, Slash was giving an interview about his upcoming album, Living the Dream. And according to Ultimate Guitar, who transcribes some of the interview, he was being interviewed by Hard Drive Radio. And he talked about how Living the Dream is the first album he's done with Miles Kennedy, The Conspirators. That's not an, a that's not an album that's done to tape. In fact, it was done uh, digitally. And the reason for that is because analog is so expensive. So Slash said during the interview that I'm an, a I'm an analog. 
I like analog because I'm a fan of the way analog sounds, but going into the studio, like the commercial studio and paying for it and all that kind of stuff is pretty taxing financially. This is coming from a guy who made $45 million a year last year. And the way the record business is now to break even on a record that you spend so much money on, the chances of you getting money back are pretty slim. So I finally resigned to doing it digitally because it's less gear, less time, and less, uh, a lot of, less a lot of things. You said Elvis, the guy who produced it, Mike Basquette, but we call him Elvis Liberace. He's really great engineer and great producer. He used some equipment that really softened up the whole digital approach. And when you listen to it, you don't think of it as a digital record. And I'm going to release it on vinyl just because of that, because of it's that soft sounding. Yeah, I'm a vinyl guy. Slash also went on to reveal that the album, you know, if he, the previous albums he recorded with Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators cost him about $100,000 to make. And Slash also talked about his upcoming tour with Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators, revealing that he's not going to be playing a bunch of Guns N' Roses song on this upcoming tour. He said that his solo band um, will mostly be playing songs from their current record as well as some of their past records. He said, when we first started out in 2010, I had the first solo album with all the different singers on it. He told Q104.3 in a new interview. So at that point, we did songs off the record and a lot of Guns N' Roses stuff, which I haven't played in years. And then some Velvet Revolver and some Slash's Snake Pit. We did that and then we recorded Apocalyptic Love. So we had a little more original material, but we kept doing the gun stuff and Velvet Revolver and so on. He continued by saying, uh, World on Fire, at that point we had a good catalog of our own stuff, but I was still digging playing Welcome to the Jungle and whatnot. Then I hook up with Guns N' Roses, so now I've played all these songs for the last two years, so I'm sort of like, okay, we don't have to do any more Guns N' Roses song, we have enough to do. And then on the subject of rekindling his chemistry with Kennedy and the Conspirators after some time away, he said the chemistry is just there automatically. It's sort of unseen organic thing that happens. When you start playing together, you know how to play off each other. You sort of predict what the other guy's going to do. I don't know how it works, but it just does. And he described his colleagues as a great little rock and roll unit. He was also asked about the future of Guns N' Roses, uh, who have nine dates scheduled in this coming November in Asia. Slash replied, that's it for the Not In This Lifetime tour. I'm going to go back with the Conspirators, and we're going to do the whole run for the next year. We'll see what happens with Guns the next cycle. So Slash also said in the interview that the song Fall to Pieces, which appeared on Velvet Revolver's first album, Contraband, was originally intended for his... Uh, this unreleased album he was working on just before Velvet Revolver formed back in 2001-2002. He was working with Steve Gorman on drums and they were about to start working on an album, but things ended up falling through when they started Velvet Revolver with Matt Sorum and Duff McKagan. And speaking of Duff McKagan, he took part in a Johnny Ramone tribute concert uh, a couple weeks ago. So he was joined by Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols, uh, Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day, and then uh, Fred Armisen as well from the show Portlandia. And these are just some pictures of the uh, Johnny Ramone tribute show that they did. So there's also a video I've got up on my blog of them performing uh, a Ramones cover you guys can go check out. And then we've also got some news about Slash's uh, first single, Driving Rain, from his upcoming record, uh, Living the Dream. So to date, it's his highest charting single so far. So it peaked at number 12 on the Billboard uh, mainstream rock charts. And for the past five weeks, it's been pretty much steady at number 12. It hasn't moving from there. Now, the song uh, peaked on number 38 on the Billboard Rock Radio Airplay charts before falling down to number 45 in the past week as well. We also had a new interview that Loudwire did with Slash where he talked about writing music after getting sober. He said a lot of the material from the old days, I can pick particular songs that were definitely written under the influence, but I can pick other songs that were written under the influence of a couple beers. Not that big of a deal, right? He said, I found when I got sober, sort of looking back from the time that I started playing up until 2006, my partying was really a matter of killing time between things. Slash elaborated by saying I wasn't really using when I was on the road. I wasn't using when I was in the studio. I was always focused on music. So when I got sober, all that effort I put into what turned to be a massive addiction at that point, I took all of that and just put straight back into the music and wasn't really reliant on me being buzzed, or should I say inebriated, to be able to create stuff. He continued by saying that I was fortunate. I really just put everything into writing and felt really comfortable sober and writing. We've also got some Steven Adler news. So Steven Adler recently performed with his new lineup of Adler's Appetite. So you guys may be familiar with the lineup he had a couple months ago. He had Constantine Morales from American Idol, and he's also a Broadway actor as well. So now he's got a new singer, 
and they performed for the first time on August 25th at the Canyon in Santa Clarita. And his new lineup features Ari Kamen on lead vocals. Now, that name may not be familiar, but if you guys remember, last time Adler played with Guns N' Roses in the Not In This Lifetime tour was in Argentina. And around that gig, or maybe it was even after Steven's appearance, he went to like a rock and roll club in Argentina and performed with a Guns N' Roses cover band. And the singer of that band was Ari Kamen. So they tried to get him before to be part of Adler's Appetite, but things didn't work out. But now he's a singer. He's a great singer. I've got some videos up on my website uh, showing him playing Welcome to the Jungle, Rocket Queen, and Paradise City. So they're going to be, I think, doing a couple more dates. And who knows, maybe they'll be having some more music in the future as well. So that's it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed that video. And be sure to follow us at gnrcentral.com. You guys can also go support our channel on Patreon as well. And you guys will get some cool perks that a lot of other fans won't get. Take care. Right What's going on? It's Alex Cross with Pokers and Blow, and you're watching GNR Central. Right on.